All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David French, and thanks for attending my talk today. And this is A Chain Is No Stronger Than Its Weakest Link. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the ways in which adversaries abuse Windows shortcut files and how defenders can hunt for and detect this behavior both statically and dynamically. And I'll also be talking about a model that Bobby Filer and I worked on to classify shortcut files as malicious or benign. Um, so just uh, briefly, a bit about me before we get started. Um, so I'm a security research engineer on Elastic Security's protections team. I work on analyzing adversary tradecraft and developing detections and hunts. And I enjoy increasing the cost of an attack for adversaries and finding ways to help defenders get the upper hand. Um, I'm a contributor to Problem Child, which is a graph-based framework used to discover anomalous patterns based on process relationships. And I used to lead Hunt Strategy at a large financial institution. And I'm a co-author of the Elastic Guide to Threat Hunting, which is a free book just to help practitioners get started with threat hunting. So let's just take a minute to go over the agenda for this talk. Um, so I'll be talking about some of the reasons why I think attackers are abusing link files and have done so for several years now. Um, for those who are not familiar with analyzing link files, I can go over the file structure and the properties that practitioners need to know about when they're either analyzing or detecting malicious links. And then I'll walk through some examples of how attackers are abusing link files in the wild to help them achieve their objectives. And then I'll call out the interesting features of those files along the way that make them stand out as suspicious. And then I'll talk about how we built a model to classify link files using machine learning. And I'm going to be walking through this process to show how security practitioners can apply their domain knowledge to extract features from samples and then apply data science techniques to try and solve a security problem. And then we'll wrap up by talking about some possible next steps for the research and then share some useful resources for people who want to learn more. So before we cover link file anatomy and how attackers are abusing them, um, let's go ahead and talk about some of the reasons why I think they've abused this file have been abusing this file type for some time. Um, so here are some of the reasons why I think um, they've been abusing them for several years now against their targets. Um, so firstly, crafting malicious links um, or modifying existing ones to include a backdoor is super easy. Um, the barriers to entry are really low uh, due to the availability of just off the shelf, open source offensive security tools. And if you're interested in those, I've included a few examples on this slide. Um, so although some people get frustrated over free and open source security tools um, or offensive security tools, I think they really provide blue teams with the opportunity to simulate adversary activity pretty easily, test their defenses, and then understand their organization's ability to detect or prevent that activity. Um, so I think traditional AV software has typically had poor detection rates for malicious links from what I've observed. Many of the scanners on virus total miss uh, malicious link on day one, but then detection rates seem to move towards 20% um, or greater within a few days of the file being submitted. So I think a um, couple of reasons these low detection rates um, might be a thing is due to the fact that there are just so many different combinations of values that can exist in link files. Um, I think AV companies might be concerned about making mistakes or quarantining or deleting the wrong files and then disrupting the user's workflow. And then we've got um, an easy delivery. It's really easy to get weaponized link files into a victim's environment. So most email gateways, proxies, firewalls, they're not configured to inspect or block this file type um, because of its legit use cases. And then finally, I think uh, lack of user or practitioner awareness might be a contributing factor to why attackers often evade our detection when using this technique. Um, so users are probably not aware of the dangers of shortcut files and security analysts might not be familiar with the ways they can be abused and how they can analyze, detect or hunt for them. So just to sum up this slide really, um, I think once we can reliably detect and prevent a technique, um, it's only then that attackers will be forced to go through the expensive time consuming process of changing their behavior. Um, and this will increase the cost of an attack for them and then tip the scales to give defenders the advantage. So as you can see from some of the examples I've included on this slide, um, attackers have been abusing link files for over 10 years. 
uh, the use of this technique is still prevalent and successful for them. So if you look in the <clears throat> MITRE ATT&CK knowledge base of adversary behavior, um, there are about 30 references there and all of them link to a report with details of a successful intrusion against an organization that, that used this. So I won't read off all these examples for you, but um, you can see that attackers have used link files to do things like maintain persistence in the victim's environment, steal credentials, obtain initial access, and execute ransomware. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, let's move on to talk about the structure of a link file. So this is gonna show you the minimum amount of information that you as practitioners need to know in order to be successful in either detecting or abusing link files, depending on what your, your goal and your day job is. So when I think about the minimum amount of information that defenders and attackers need to know, I think that blue teams must know the basic anatomy of link files and how to analyze them in order to identify if one is malicious or benign. And then attackers must know how link files can be abused and what defenders are looking for in order to evade detection. So in a nutshell, a link file is just a convenient pointer to another file. Um, the target of the link file, like you can see at the bottom right hand of this slide. Um, it's not the only interesting information, so there's a bit more to link files than what you can see when you just right click one and select properties. <clears throat> so in these next few slides, I'll, I'll go through the structure and properties of a link file that you need to know about. Um, so Microsoft's specification for this file type is about 50 pages. Um, I'll save you some time and just call out the highlights. So, here are the values of the file signature or the magic number and the class identifier that enable us and the Windows OS to identify link files even if the file extension is not .link. Um, so you've got several open source link file parsers available. Um, I like to use Eric Zimmerman's LE command. Um, it's fast, it's reliable, and you can, there's an option to parse link files in bulk. Um, so I'm gonna be using LE command in the examples that I'll be walking, walking through in this presentation. So here's an example output from LE command after a benign Internet Explorer shortcut is passed, just an example. Um, I'll call out the properties that you need to be aware of. So first and foremost, um, the target of the link file is stored in a list format in the file structure. Um, LE command just goes ahead and passes that out for us and conveniently displays the full path for us. And then you've got the file size property. Um, this is the file size of the link files target, not the link file itself. So something to be aware of if you're doing forensics. Um, also just above the file size, you can see the modified, accessed and created timestamps. Uh, these are super useful during digital forensics investigations, like when you're producing a timeline of an intrusion or maybe an insider threats activity. Um, but these are gonna be out of scope for this talk. So we're, we're talking about how link files are abused and then how to tell when that's happening. And then you've got the 32 link flags. Um, these specify which structures are present in the rest of the link file. So some of them are reserved or unused. Um, as a couple of examples, the has arguments flag means that the link is saved with command line arguments. And has icon location means that a path is specified to display an icon for the link file. And then you've got the drive type property. So this specifies the type of drive that the link file is stored on. Um, so for example, it could be stored on a fixed drive, a removable media or a network drive. Um, this value is another one that's useful in forensic investigations to verify what files were accessed by a user or an attacker. And then here's some information that's useful if you're interested in tracking adversaries and relationships between link files and intrusion campaigns. Um, so when an attacker creates a malicious link file in their environment in preparation of delivering it to their victim, the volume serial number, net BIOS name, and MAC address of their computer is included in the link file. Um, so some attackers are either unaware that this happens or they forget to wipe one or more of these values. Um, so this data can be used for tracking campaigns or adversaries on services like VirusTotal. Um, another one to watch out for is the user SID. So that's not shown in this example but that can give you information about the network, computer, and user account that was used 
to create the link file in the attacker's environment. And then we've got the show command. So um, this specifies the state of the target application's window after the link file was executed. Um, so keep an eye out for the show min no active value. This means that the application window is going to be hidden from the, the user or the victim um, when they click the link file. And this could be an indication of the attacker trying to hide their code execution from the, from the victim. And then finally, here are a couple of additional properties to be aware of that weren't shown in the example that we just walked through. Um, so the icon location value specifies the path where the link files icon is stored. Um, and the command line arguments, they're executed with the link files target when the link is clicked. So in this example, we can see um, the link files target is PowerShell. And then we can see a script in the command line arguments being executed. So the script um, imports the bits transfer module and then reaches out to a, a URI to download a file called 7z.ping. Um, so this one looks really suspicious at first glance. So in this next section, we'll review some of the ways that attackers use malicious link files to achieve their objectives. Um, I'll walk through an analysis of some malicious examples and then point out the features that make them stand out as suspicious along the way. So um, what I'm going to give you here is some information that you can use in your detection or threat hunting efforts. So weaponized link files are commonly used to obtain initial access or to maintain persistence in a victim's environment. Um, to gain initial access to a target environment, attackers will often craft a link file to execute a, execute a malicious one-liner or a script. And that will usually leverage living off the LAN binary like PowerShell or um, the command prompt. Um, a common example would be a PowerShell one-liner to download some malware. And then link files during this phase are usually delivered via email or in a compressed archive file to the victim. Um, they could be embedded in an office document or they'll include a URL for the victim to download and execute the file. And then for persistence, um, attackers will often place a link file in a location where their one-liner or malware will execute every time the user logs on or when the computer starts up. Um, or they'll modify an existing shortcut file to include a backdoor. So each time the shortcut is executed, the original application will load and then the malicious code will execute in the background as well. Um, and then another persistence technique is to craft a link file that forces user authentication. So this can allow the attacker to harvest the user's password hashes and then they can try and crack those to obtain the clear text password or they can use those in a pass the hash attack. So let's um, analyze some malicious links and then identify what features can help us identify them as suspicious. And then we can use those features for detection, hunting, or to build our own classifier that we'll talk about in a bit. So here's an example of a malicious link that was used in an intrusion campaign um, to gain access to several organizations. Um, FireEye attributed this particular example to APT29. And the attackers sent a phishing email to their targets that included a URL to download a zip file from um, a OneDrive account. And then that zip archive file contained a malicious link. And then when that malicious link was executed, um, a PowerShell script was executed, which extracted a decoy document for the user to view to distract them. And then in the background, a Cobalt, Cobalt Strike Beacon DLL was extracted, and then that was executed. Um, and that DLL provided a connection back to the attacker. <clears throat> so when a link file is executed, the, the new process is spawned as a child process of explorer.exe. Um, that can make dynamic detection a bit of a challenge, but there are other ways to identify malicious link files, um, and we can walk through those examples. So let's examine this link file that was used in this campaign and understand what makes it look suspicious. So when we pass this malicious link file and start to look at its properties, some things immediately stand out as suspicious. Um, so this link file's target is powershell.exe, which is um, a commonly abused binary used to execute malicious code or scripts. And then it's got long command line arguments that usually indicates the presence of um, an encoded command or a script. 
And we can see in this example, it looks to be a base 64 um, blob of encoded data. And then we've got the parameters, non-interactive to prevent an interactive prompt from being displayed to the victim. And then um, execution policy bypass to bypass any default PowerShell kind of execution policy that's configured. So something that's important to note with regards to the command line arguments, um, when you look at the properties of a link file in the Windows UI, the file's target and command line arguments will be truncated after 260 characters. So in an attempt to evade detection, um, attackers have been known to craft malicious links with a benign target and then include some padding like white space before the command line. And then that will hide the full value from the Windows UI and sometimes evade detection or um, kind of a human analyzing the link file. And then here are some additional features that help us identify this, this link file as suspicious. So um, I mentioned earlier that the show command, if that's set to show min no active, that will mean that the application window of the new process will be minimized and not immediately visible to the victim who clicks. <clears throat> And then um, this is a good one. So link files are usually between four kilobytes and 20 kilobytes. This one is 400 kilobytes. Whenever I see a large link file like this one, um, it leads me to believe that the file contains other embedded content like files or scripts. Um, this one is, if you recall from earlier, it contains a malicious DLL and a decoy PDF document, um, which accounts for the larger file size. And then the zone identifier is a good one to, to look out for as well. So um, depending on the internet browser or the application that was used to download the file. Um, a zone ID, alternate data stream will be added to the file to indicate it was downloaded from outside the host network. So a zone ID on a file greater than one typically means that it came from outside of the network. Um, another interesting feature is the entropy or randomness of these link files. So the top screenshot shows the entropy of the malicious link um, that we've been talking about. And the bottom one shows the entropy of just a benign Google Chrome shortcut file. So a link with high entropy can be an indicator that the file contains compressed or encrypted content. Um, so for this example, the, the number of suspicious features have really added up. So um, let's move on to look at another couple of examples. So another technique that attackers can use to is to uh, modify an existing link file to include a backdoor. So each time the user clicks on the link file, um, say it was Google Chrome, just as a, to see this example on this slide, um, Google Chrome will still execute. <clears throat> so the original binary is executed, but the backdoor is also executed in the background um, away from the user. So PowerShell Empire has got a pretty good module that enables attackers to carry out this technique easily. Um, invoke backdoor link, just lets you specify a link file to include a PowerShell stager. So I remember working at a company where uh, a red teamer did this, um, and it was a bit tricky to figure out exactly how the PowerShell stager was um, being executed. So PowerShell was shown as the child of explorer.exe. Um, it's not something that blue teams are typically monitoring for, um, because that behavior looks pretty normal and happens all the time. But the red team had backdoored um, Windows Server Manager on several servers. So whenever a system administrator logged on, the stager executed and then a new C2 channel will be established. <clears throat> um, so another technique available to attackers is to include an IP address or URI in the icon path of a link file. Um, so when Windows renders the link file in Explorer, it forces SMB authentication from the victim host to the attacker's IP address. Um, so one way to reduce the effectiveness of this one is to block egress SMB traffic from your network, and that will stop them from capturing the hashes and trying to crack them or using them in a, a pass the hash attack. Um, but still, if the attacker is already in the network and they place a link file on a heavily used network share, it can still be quite effective at capturing hashes from thousands of users inside your network. <clears throat> um, and here's an example of that technique being used for your reference. Um, so. Offensive tools like LinkUp make it easy to craft one of these link files to carry out the technique. And then you can use the SMB authentication capture Metasploit module, and you can collect the password hashes. Um, so given this, this presentation is only 30 minutes, I don't, I don't have enough time to go into detail about the behavior-based detections for malicious links. 
Um, Elastic has open sourced event query language, which is uh, um, originally created for security detection and threat hunting use cases. And it's currently being integrated with the Elastic stack. Um, it's easy to learn and read and write queries. Um, you can query on sequences of events for different event types. Um, and in the appendix of these slides for your reference, I've, I've included um, some behavior-based detections for malicious links. And you can check out the equal analytics library if you're interested in free detections. Um, there are about 130 free analytics for detection and they're all mapped to the MITRE attack matrix. <clears throat> so with regards to hunting for malicious link files in your environment, um, here's a crude but effective method that can produce a big win for your team. Um, so it's amazing how many threat groups try and evade our defenses, but then they risk giving themselves away by creating a link file in the user's startup folder to maintain persistence. And then that link file will execute every time the, the victim logs on. Um, so it's one of the oldest tricks in the book, but it still goes undetected in a lot of environments um, because defenders aren't looking. So a quick hunt would be um, to use le command to pass the link files in commonly abused locations on your endpoints. And then you could index that data in a central repository or SIM. And then you can query and visualize that data to surface normally. So um, a simple but effective method is you can sort the results in ascending order by the link files target or command line arguments. And then once you've learned what's normal in your environment, this should be a low effort hunt to either automate or just complete periodically. Um, so one way to approach the problem of identifying link files as malicious or benign is um, to call it a classification problem. Um, so while examining several link files and then identifying the features that make them stand out as suspicious, uh, we tried to build our own classifier to um, classify them using data science techniques. So the next few slides show a practitioner's attempt to use machine learning to classify link files and explain the process from start to finish. So my goal is that this shows practitioners how accessible um, data science techniques are and that machine learning can be effective at solving a problem most of the time, but it's not a silver bullet. So early on in the talk when we were passing link files and then identifying the important features to help us understand if they're malicious or benign, we were doing feature extraction. Um, we're essentially transforming our domain knowledge into features and then we can apply machine learning or other data science techniques to try and solve the problem. So I analyzed lots of malicious and benign link files um, and started building out a data set. Um, so when we decided to build a, a model, um, I had to normalize that data before I could run it through any algorithms and then try and predict whether a, a file is malicious or benign. So um, how do we go from thousands of link file reports like the one shown on this slide to something like this? Um, which is an array that represents the features of the past link file shown on the left hand side. Um, so the model that we want to run our data through needs to be needs to see data in this kind of numeric format. So um, some features of a link file, um, like file size or entropy, they're, they're already in a numeric format. So those are easy to handle. Um, but how do you present represent features like command line arguments as, as a number? Um, so this was called um, Feature engineering, so um, we were asking questions of the link file data, so um, we separated file sizes into bins. Um, larger link files would be in a bin with a higher number. Um, and for values like the show command, um, we can just use the pandas uh, libraries factorize function. That gives a numerical representation of these values. And then for the remaining examples on this slide, um, we just create features in a binary like true or false, one or zero method by checking each link file for certain values. So uh, does a link file have long command line arguments, true or false, does it have high entropy, that kind of thing. So um, end result was just this normalized data set of uh, malicious and benign kind of labeled link files. So then after preparing the data set, um, I started looking at possible methods to classify link files. So one option was a decision tree. Um, very simple example shown on this slide. So decision trees, answer sequential questions and then operate in a, if this, then that method, and then they lead us to the answer. So is the file malicious or benign? Um, advantages of decision trees are that they're fast, they don't need a lot of data, they're easy to interpret. Um, disadvantages that, that they're slow to train and then uh, difficult to tune. 
So then we decided to try and use a random forest classifier. <clears throat> so this classifier essentially takes a set of decision trees from a randomly se selected subset of the data. And then what you end up with is multiple trees with different portions of data. Um, each tree gets a vote on what the answer should be. And then those votes from the individual trees are aggregated to decide if the final class of the link file is uh, malicious or benign. So um, the good thing about this type of classifier is even if a few individual decision trees are prone to noise, the overall result, once all the votes of the decision trees are aggregated um, or considered, should be correct. Um, so here's some information about the experiment that we set up using the data set and training a random forest classifier to try and identify the links as malicious or benign. Um, so the data set consisted of around 2,500 benign and 30,000 passed and labeled uh, malicious link files. So this is um, quite an imbalance, but this is um, a common challenge when attempting to solve security problems using data science. <clears throat> um, but the extracted features should be descriptive enough to separate malicious from benign samples. Um, so let's move on to talk about how we train the classifier and then what the results look like. So the next few slides show what we did with the data set of link files and the random forest classifier. So at this point, every link file in the data set was passed and um, normalized into an array, what you see on this slide. So the data was set into two data sets. Um, it was kind of an 80%, 20% split. So we had the training data set to train the classifier and then the 20% left in the test data set for the classifier to try and classify those link files as malicious benign and then we can kind of um, analyze those results. So um, we use the training data set to train the classifier on what a malicious versus benign link file looks like. And then the link files in the test data set were reserved. So once the classifier was trained, um, we had it classify the link files in the test data set. And then <clears throat> the output from that was an array of uh, labels the link files to um, tell us if the classifier thought they were malicious or benign. And then for the results, um, we decided to use a confusion matrix to analyze the uh, model's accuracy. So this matrix shows the count of true negatives, false positives, false negatives, true positives. Um, so in general, we want to keep the false positives and false negatives quite low. Um, and then to put these results in simple terms, 32 files were classified incorrectly out of almost 7,000. Um, and then the vast majority of files were classified correctly. So I would say um, before this model is production ready though, I'd like to increase the number of benign samples in the data set to observe how this accuracy changes. And I'd like to obviously also ensure that there isn't a, a huge increase in false positives. Um, so we'll just spend a minute talking about what the classifier didn't do well on. Um, like I said, machine learning can work a lot of the time, but it's not 100% accurate. Um, false positives consisted of link files that utilize commonly abused binaries like um, cmd.exe to execute one-liners, um, to add software, um, link files from software like pzip archiver, uh, PDF creator, and some PC optimizer software. And then some of the link files that kind of slipped by the classifier completely were pretty interesting. So um, a couple of backdoor link files, internet browser shortcuts that would communicate with the attacker when they're executed. And then um, a couple of LOL bins using to, to execute things like uh, malicious DLLs. So um, when I think about what we could do better, um, we can look at using something like TFIDF that can determine the importance of each word in the command line arguments. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we could continue building a data set to kind of balance the number of malicious, malicious and benign files out. Um, so just to wrap up really, really quick, um, as I said earlier, I think attackers will continue abusing link files while the de detection rates are still quite low. Um, once defenders can reliably detect and disrupt the effectiveness of this attack is when the attackers will be forced to abandon this technique in favor of something else. Um, so hopefully I've shown you that there are several opportunities to detect or hunt for malicious links. And when we consider applying machine learning to try and solve 
classification problems. Uh, the domain knowledge of practitioners is really valuable for doing things like feature extraction. And um, data science techniques are accessible to practitioners, but if you're able to work with an experienced data scientist on a problem, um, they can help you avoid common pitfalls like interpreting results incorrectly or maybe choosing the wrong algorithm or classifier to use. And then um, it's just important to note that this research doesn't solve the problem entirely. Um, I'd like to continue building the, the data set of link files and extracting additional features for the classifier. And now I'm looking to see if we can build a machine learning job um, in Elastic Security to detect malicious link files. Uh, so I think I'm at the 30 minute mark. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter or I'm on the B-Sides um, Slack workspace so you can reach out to me there. But um, yeah, thanks for attending.